radiating from the Lone Star State and stretching from coast to coast and border to border. This is On Radio, the weekly download from your family of companies, CMS Wireless, Entertech, ET Tower, Legacy, and Mountain Wireless. Welcome to On Radio. He is the new president and CEO, that's Chief Executive Officer of WIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association, and for you old guys out there, formerly PCIA, the Personal Communications Industry Association, a blast from the past. Patrick, welcome to the On Radio Podcast. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to talking with you. All right. Well, you spent a bit of time running around the country. We're going to chat about that. But before we do, you're kind of the new guy on the block, just finished your first month on the job. Tell us, who's Patrick? Patrick, passionate advocate for communications issues. Been doing this over 20 years now. Started my career focused on public safety communications. It was fascinating. It was a, a consulting firm, you know, who was working with companies like Singular and, and associations like CTIA at the time. And we formed a little coalition. Actually, it had to do with uh, the fact that you couldn't get a tower sited in Rock Creek Park in D.C. Uh -huh. For those of you who haven't been to D.C., Rock Creek Park is kind of like the central park of Washington. And we were trying to get some towers sited, so we formed a coalition. And it was basically bringing together carriers, OnStar, and with emergency docs and nurses and police, fire, EMS. And it was basically forming a coalition of industry and public safety explaining the value of having access to a wireless signal. This was in the late 90s. That's how I got started. From there, I went and was you know, doing that, that work, and then I became the director of uh, government affairs for NINA, the National 911 Association, uh -huh. which was a great job for somebody earlier in their career because basically every industry who's got access to consumers has a 911 issue. So you know, the traditional telephone companies who are the, you know, the backbone of the 911 system, the wireless carriers, you know, with wireless location accuracy issues, the voice over IP guys. It was actually right around the time when the, the uh, VoIP was required to do 911. So I ended up having a really nice cross section working with all these different uh, providers. And I was the, the annoying voice on the other side of it from the public safety community, giving everybody a hard time to do more and do better. From there, I went to the FCC. I went to law school in the middle of all that, so I'm a lawyer. We're not uh, going to hold that against you. Yeah. <laughs> I started at the FCC literally three months after the national broadband plan came out. I don't know if you all remember that from 2010. Actually, a lot of the stuff we're working on now uh, and a lot of the spectrum that's being deployed as we speak is somewhat because of that broadband plan. Uh, and was at the commission for several years, about five years, was in private practice, again, focused on all communications policy from wireless to wireline to satellite. And then I was over at U.S. Telecom, general counsel at U.S. Telecom, running all their advocacy for several years. And then somebody said, hey, what about WIA? And I said, what about WIA? Let's talk about it. And here I am. <laughs> well, you know, it's fascinating. We've got lots of friends at the FCC. And like I told you before, we work on both sides of the aisle, uh, unless unless they're against safety or unless, unless they're against connectivity or workforce development, any of those issues that were so near and dear to the people who actually build the infrastructure. But when we look at the training for your role that you had over the history of your time, not only in D.C., but in and around the telecom space, it's fascinating. You're really, really the most qualified guy for the job, aren't you? Well, I certainly think so. I've got a lot of gas in the tank, um, have a lot of energy, have a lot of passion for this industry. I'm looking forward to working really hard to uh, be the best advocate I can on behalf of our members. And, you know, I do have a lot of experience working at the intersection of communications policy and, and innovation and trying to really figure out, you know, how to really advance the ball to, to continue to allow the communications industry to do what it does best, which is deploy networks. The, you know, I think from my from my experience, it's it's the mix of working with lots of different um, aspects of the communications ecosystem, working within government and working within the association world, which is a nice combination of, of, of experience. Now, what I haven't done, to be fully candid, right, is work really closely with all of the infrastructure companies that make up WIA. I've been more focused on the carrier side. 
perfectly well aware of what's going on over at WIA. But that's what I've been traveling around the last two months doing. It's why I've been on the road so much is, look, I get communications policy. I get strategy. I get politics. I get D.C. I understand the, the work we have to do at the state level and, and how to get that done. What's most important for me right now is what's driving our members' business, right, from all, mm -hmm. all of the different aspects of our membership. And that's why I've been on the road so much is just talking to people and listening. Certainly. Uh, important thing, man. So, but you're also, rumor has it, a musician. Pretty darn mm -hmm. good one, which seems to be a prerequisite for the job, isn't it? You know, it, it seems to be. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> what I left out of my uh, my resume there was the two years where I quit my job and went on the, on the road and played guitar for a living. I'm a rhythm guitar guy. I'm a solid rhythm player. You're never going to hear me shredding solos, you know, like Jimi <laughs> Hendrix. But I'm a solid rhythm guitar player. And, uh, yeah, I, I decided from 02 to 04, a buddy of mine from high school that I used to play with got a major major label record deal, said, why don't you join me? And I said, you know what? How could I say no to that? And yeah, we, went on, we went on the road and uh, all over the place, from the House of Blues in L.A. to Chicago, New York, Florida, Texas, everywhere. And it was a great time. Awesome. But at some point I had to come back and start earning a living again. Yeah, get a real job, right? <laughs> yeah, get a haircut and get a real job, exactly. <laughs> All right. We talked about you. Uh, how, what about your, the most important part of Patrick? Any family that uh, you'd like to talk about or share with us? Yep, that's what drives all this, isn't it, at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. Married to my wife, Dr. Tina Halley. She's a uh, pediatrician, a physician at Children's National Medical Center in D.C., Oh, um, wow. You really married up, man. Oh, wow. I, I, <laughs> believe me, I know every day I did that I married up. Uh, uh, Couldn't uh, do what I'm doing now did. without her. <laughs> most of us in the tower business all married up. It's pretty. We, we set the bar yeah. really low. Yep, and, and I have uh, two fantastic sons, Owen and Marcus. Uh, just went into high school. One's a freshman in high school, and one uh, just started middle school. All right. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's the family. Thank you. All right. As we look at your joining WIA, you did this at a critical time, at a critical place in not only telecom, but American history. Talk to us about the technological changes that are going to be confronting WIA and how, how, uh, how that's going to shape your role, your legacy, if you will, at WIA. Well, right. So we're in the middle, on the front end, really, of this 5G revolution. We already got people talking about 6G, rightly so. You know, we always have to be forward looking. And really, I think the way I think about these things is it's what does it all enable, right? So we talk about how many towers are there, how many small cells are there, what's happening next. And what it enables is effectively everything. You know what I mean? There's really nothing that it doesn't enable. And what that means is everywhere we are, people are, are going to expect and demand, you know, access to high capacity, high speed connectivity for everything that they're doing. And so, you know, look, it starts with the macro tower, you know, and the signal that, that, that those towers broadcast over large swaths of, of the United States. And of course, increasingly we're seeing uh, new technologies you know, that are filling in the networks with the, via small cells. Uh, we're looking at, obviously, the DAS systems, the in-building wireless systems, the private LTE networks that are going up. And all of that just strengthening the signal everywhere, everywhere that a consumer is going to be or that a business is going to be. We're also seeing that we're starting to look at a lot of the real estate that our members operate on as not just a place where a tower sits, but where infrastructure that is, you know, a, a data center can be located. So you're seeing a lot of discussion around the, the data center closer to the edge of the network where you're, you have the intersection of edge computing and cloud. You know, what does that look like? It's really sure. exciting, all of this. Yeah. And so our job is basically just to make sure that whatever the industry wants to deploy can be deployed as efficiently and effectively as possible. And we're going to work closely with you, not only at Ontivity, but through the, the National Association of Tower Rectors and, and uh, our membership at CTIA. We've got to work because we have an international race. I'll use the words of, of Brennan Carr and Chairman Rose, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and say that we need to win the digital divide. We need to not only bridge it, but then on an international level to win the race to 5G. How's, how's WIA helping that? It's more than just citing now, isn't it? Yeah, look, it's a lot of things. I, I look at WIA and I look at the I in WIA, and I've been talking a lot about this, as lots of different things. It's 
ensuring that we have effective policies in place so that the physical infrastructure that needs to be deployed, whether that's a macro tower, a small cell, or something else, can be deployed where it should be deployed, you know, responsibly, of course, number one. Number two, the invisible infrastructure spectrum. You know, we just concluded the 2.5 uh, gigahertz auction a couple weeks sure. ago, and there is no other spectrum auction scheduled right now. Just this week, we had Secretary Raimondo and NTIA Chief Alan Davidson and Chairwoman Rosenworcel all coming together talking about a national spectrum strategy. But that's important because we need to identify those bands. We need more spectrum. Uh, there will be more, uh, you know, equipment and technology that's being put onto our towers uh, as a result of having more spectrum. Right now, there isn't a pipeline, so we need to work on that. And that's something that WIA uh, is going to be focused on along with the carriers that are, that, are, that are leading the charge there. And then third is the human infrastructure, the people, the people doing the work and, you know, getting uh, a, a really highly skilled and trained workforce. And there's lots of aspects of that. It's making the public aware of the jobs that are available in our industry getting getting the the young people who are sort of trying to figure out what's next in their life to understand the value of a job in, in our sector so we're spending a lot of time on the workforce development side training apprentices working with the university systems working with state governments to try to uh, develop the content and bring academia together with industry to ensure that we're creating an on-ramp for people that that can come on and, and start working for our companies and these are more, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, workforce development later, but but we have to really emphasize that this is careers. I, I, I got a chance to stand before the Wireless Hall of Fame and, and give a little chat, and I talked about everybody in the room, because everybody in the room who was there was there because of wireless, not because of uh, not because of a, a job, but because of a career. But um, I want to stick for a moment with politics, because... People think of politics and they don't and they don't and they don't think of stuff that affects them. They think of this land of uh, far off Washington, D.C. That's that's uh, frankly these days uh, colored with bad, bad ink and bad blood and bad people. But it's not about politics. It's actually about policies and the policies that come out of D.C. affect our climbers and they affect their families. What are we going to do to affect those policies at WIA? So first of all, we're going to we're going to focus a lot about communicating to the policymakers, regardless of their party, you know, the value of what we are doing as an industry, what we're creating in terms of economic growth and job creation, the societal benefits for all of the different sectors of our economy and, and the jobs that are that are out there. That's important because they need to be thinking about us in a positive light not in a negative light. And sometimes they are just because of uh, some of the advocacy that you hear from some other uh, uh, size of the political equation here. Um, that's first. Second, look, this is not, it sh our industry should not be a, a, a red or a blue industry. It just isn't, right? To your point. If oh, you're yeah. against safety or you're against communications, it seems something's off, right? Yeah. Um, and or so, good careers. It's great jobs, and what we enable is extremely important. So as a general matter, you know, th there are, there's, there's just politics involved in everything, unfortunately. It is, how it, it is what it is. But I think that um, for the most part, we have an environment where I think we can get a lot of things done. That said, look, we have a 2-2 FCC right now. Two R's, two D's. I can't believe we're almost two years into this administration and we still only have a split FCC. Because of politics... Mm -hmm we might not have a fifth commissioner for a long time. And that yeah. will affect some of the decisions that get made out of Washington. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens with the election in November, but it does have consequences, I can tell you that. Right, and they're working together, frankly, in our conversations with both uh, the chairman and, and with, and with uh, Carr, they're working together remarkably well, which is really unusual for DC. But a lot of what our folks don't realize when they're out in the field building towers and stuff is that we're all about creating competitive choices for consumers, aren't we? We absolutely are. In fact, one of the things I've been talking about a lot recently is the, the real growth of fixed wireless, 5G fixed wireless to the home as a competitor to the wireline broadband uh, industry. For a long time, we've heard a lot in D.C. about a lack of competition. Uh, and this administration, look, they came out with a, a competition executive order right off the bat, effectively suggesting there's not enough competition. And there is actually a lot of competition right now. 
Um, yeah. Certainly, there's a heavy focus on fiber deployment by the traditional, you know, ILEX that are out there. Cables investing in fiber. On top of all that, you know, the wireless industry is, is going bananas right now uh, in terms of deploying their spectrum for fixed wireless to the home. Some recent stats I was looking at, you know, for the first time in a long time, the cable industry actually lost subscribers in Q2 yeah. of this year, as did the wireline ISPs. They lost subscribers. The ones who didn't were the wireless carriers on the fixed side. Yeah, we know where they're um, going, don't we? Right, right. So you've got a lot of, you had a couple million people in the second quarter sign up for fixed wireless 5G to the home. And when you look at it, and uh, another stat that I was, I thought was pretty compelling was for over the last year, 56%, this was in June, 56% of net broadband subscribers to the home were fixed wireless. Now, the cable industry will tell you, well, that's a short-term thing. Over the long term, we're not really worried about it. They, they acknowledge that it's, that it's a real thing right now. But, but here's the way I think about it. Look, I if I'm getting we heard that from megabit, DISH as well, didn't we? They're not worried about their subscriber base, and that's why they're doing wireless, right? <laughs> Everybody's doing wireless. Cable, the, the thing cable is doing a lot is signing up mobile subscribers, right? Yeah, um, exactly. But on the fixed wireless side, look, if you've got 100 and, and, and increasingly, depending on where you are, two, three, four, five hundred 500 megabit per second service at a lot lower price point than the traditional wireline service, and, and fiber rolls into your neighborhood two years later, I'm not convinced you're going to switch. Why? I have a perfectly good service that's doing everything I need and, and with you know, great customer service from the, from the wireless industry that's providing it. The WISPs are also are doing well. So I actually think that's a pretty big developing story, and I'm interested to see where it goes. And here's the other thing. This, this notion that it's not future-proof, look, it's not fixed wireless versus fiber. A lot of our companies do all of this, right? Fiber will make right. a lot of sense in a lot of communities. Yeah. But that, that network needs to be replaced, too, over time. Number one. Number two, if the carriers are deploying a 5G fixed wireless to the home service, and today it's doing 100, 2, 3, 400 megs, there's no doubt in my mind that five years from now and seven years from now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do double that. Just because carriers innovate, because that new spectrum comes on board. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm, I'm really bullish on wireless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I think it's the biggest competitor right there right now that's emerging uh, as another real choice on top of the mobility that it already has. We'll talk to you again, folks, next Thursday. But until then, let's choose safety today. This is Jim, and I am out.